All right. Well, today, let's start by reading from the book of 1 John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. It's 1 John, chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we would be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Verse 2. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Okay, so this starts with love. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us. What do you suppose? Do you suppose that this love is a feeling that a, a good earthly father might have for his beloved child? Now, that's, that's certainly a, a good picture of it, but it goes far beyond any human example. And I don't mean that it goes beyond as in it's just stronger or more intense. I mean that it transcends any human emotion or <laughs> any emotion at all. True love, timeless love, perfect love causes emotion, but that emotion is just a result. It's uh, the feeling itself is not the love. So when we read about the great love that our Father God has bestowed upon us or has poured out upon us, this ultimately is not uh, th this ultimately is not the expression of a feeling that we call love, any more than God himself is a feeling, or, or God himself is an emotion, for God is love. So, we could read this like so. See how fully God has poured out himself upon us, how completely he has surrounded us, how deeply he has immersed us, how intimately he is embracing us, that we would be called the children of God. You know, when, when a child looks like an adult, people assume that the adult is that child's parent. And when we are dwelling in the presence, the love, and thus the nature of God, we automatically point others to Him. We look like Him, just like a child resembles his or her parents. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. The mind of the world, attached to the things that are passing away, unaware of God, foreign to true love, blind to true life, does not and can never know God. So, when we look like God, the mind of the world cannot know us either. And when the mind does not know and cannot know, cannot understand what it does not know and what it does not uh, cannot understand is seen by the mind as at least weird and, and stupid or wrong, <laughs> or it's seen as an enemy that must be destroyed. And you know what? That's okay. The world cannot touch you. No one in the world can touch you. Now, it can torture or kill your body, but it cannot touch you. The real you and the world are on two separate planes, two separate dimensions. 
The world cannot touch the spirit, no matter how hard it tries. Now, the foolish, carnal mind thinks that it has abolished yet another enemy, whether through arguments or through physical force. But the earthly mind is lost in severe delusion, is it not? It's kind of like someone who who builds himself a, a dark wooden box and then boasts that he has destroyed the sun. <laughs> now, when we ourselves are, are lost in the worldly mind, we, we fear that some human or some force of nature might hurt or destroy us. But when we are dwelling in the timeless, eternal presence of God, that delusion fades. It fades into the distance. It loses its imagined importance. We stop taking it seriously. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Verse 2. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. So, when we see him, we will be like him. In what way will we be like him? Do you think we're going to look like him physically? Hey there, Mary, what a nice beard you suddenly have since you saw Jesus. <laughs> Maybe we'll be like him instead in the clothes we wear. Like, perhaps we'll wear the same type of robe and sandals. <laughs> or maybe we'll be like him in his mode of transportation. Hey, have you seen Joe's new donkey? I want a donkey like that, except I want mine red instead of green like his. <laughs> or maybe we'll be like him in the human languages we speak. This silly job application is just like all the others. It doesn't have a checkbox in languages for Aramaic or Hebrew or Greek. <laughs> okay, so... How about this? Maybe we'll be like him because of what we do. Now, that's a bit closer, wouldn't you agree? What would Jesus do? But this does not say we will do like him when we see him, but that we will be like him. And if we be like him, we will do like him. That's how it works. Doing that flows out of willpower is weak at best. But doing that flows out of being is full of power. Now, don't get me wrong. What would Jesus do is a very good question to ask if you find yourself lost in the mind. If you find yourself inwardly beating your neighbor in the head because he's being way too loud, then you are lost in the earthly mind. And you can either ask what Jesus would do, and then choose to do that, <laughs> or you can step out of the mind and into presence, and your doing will then flow out of that being. Does that make sense? When we see him, we will be like him. Complaining, gossiping, talking bad about someone when they're not there, <laughs> worrying, fearing, doubting, envying, holding unforgiveness, holding resentment. Whenever you realize that you're doing any of these things, 
you can know that you most certainly are lost in the mind, the earthly mind, the carnal mind, the fleshly mind. And while you can think about him with the mind, you cannot truly see him because you can see him only with the spirit, with the life, with the being, with the presence that you are. And when you see him, you will be like him. You will be like he is. You will be present like he is present. And you know, dwelling in that place where Jesus is, that time when Jesus is, where we sit with him in that heavenly realm. That is far above and not caught up in earthly stories and temporary forms. Then and there, we will see him. Not just a form like, like the painting that might be hanging on your wall, but the life the love, the one God that he is. And you won't see that with your physical eyes, but with your presence. You know, most people don't know what life is. Most people are riding a roller coaster the roller coaster of the earthly mind. Their, their ups are happy. Their downs are tragic. Their twists and turns are stressful and, and perhaps addictive. But they do not dwell in peace. Well, let me ask you, do you dwell in peace? Peace that does not diminish when you lose your job or, or your imagined source of income. Or when the doctor says that you have such and such a condition or a disease. Or when your only vehicle gets totaled or the engine blows up and you don't know how you're going to get to where you think you need to go. Are you still? in peace? The world doesn't have it. You will not find it in the mind. You will not find it by thinking about it or imagining it. You won't find it by, sol by solving your so-called problems. In John chapter 14 and verse 27, Jesus says this, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You know, as long as you are lost in thinking, lost in the mind, you are not and you cannot dwell in peace. When you feel resentment or unforgiveness, that's just a signpost that says, you are in the flesh, you are lost in the mind. When you feel impatience, that's just an indicator that you are being of the world. When you're fearful, when you're anxious, when you're worried, when you're afraid. Those are just symptoms that, that are telling you that you are identified with the mind instead of with true life. Try this sometime. Stand in front of a mirror. Look at your face. Look at your physical form. 
Do you see yourself? Is that who you are? Maybe, as you look into the reflection of your eyes, or your expressions, you might be able to see or sense your personality. Do you see yourself? Is that who you are? Perhaps as you stand there, you'll, you might remember your history, the story of your past. Or you might think about your imagined future, where you want to go or what you want to become. Do, your, do you see yourself in that? Is that who you are? You know, if the truth be known, most people never have the slightest clue of who or what they really are. As long as you're seeing everything through the mind, you cannot see yourself. And as long as, as you are lost in thinking about who you are, well, I'm a spirit. I'm not these outer things. This is what I think as long as you're thinking about it, then you still cannot see yourself. And consider this. If you cannot see yourself while standing in front of a mirror, do you think that you can see God? And if you cannot see Him, how can you be like Him? You can act like him, and that's good. Uh, the best the mind uh, the best the mind can mimic, you can be like him. <laughs> but you cannot actually be like him until you can see him. Does that make sense? You can act like him. You can act like you think he acts, but you cannot be like him until you truly see him. Well, here's some wonderful news. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord and everyone who puts their trust in him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. You know, this passage is worded in the future tense. And everyone who puts their trust in Jesus will see him someday. And when they see him, they will be like him. It's all going to be wonderful in the end. Everyone who is in Christ will be fully awake, fully present, fully enlightened someday. But this is a call, a challenge, an invitation to not wait for the sweet by and by to see him and to be like him. If you aren't trusting in Jesus, put your trust in him now. Who else can save you from your sins? Who else can deliver you from evil? There is no genuinely good reason to not trust him now. All the reasons you might th have that you might think you have are completely foolish. They aren't worth being taken seriously. Trust him now. There's no other time that you can trust him. And if you have put your trust in Jesus, then you know that his spirit lives inside of you. He provides for your needs, not you. He leads you into truth, not your mind. He saves you from sin, 
not your own efforts. He makes you righteous and not your own good deeds. And so, you already know inside that you can stop putting your trust in the mind, and you should stop putting your trust in the mind, in the never-ending, highly repetitive, dim, and delusional earthly mind. Thoughts cannot save you. Thoughts cannot meet any real need. Thoughts cannot bring you peace. Thoughts cannot see God. The past and the future, the domain of the mind, are not where God is. Now, wait just a minute, the mind objects. I've always been taught, and I've always heard, and I've always believed that God has already been in my future. Sorry, mind. <laughs> Just as a small child cannot understand the details required to build and operate a nuclear power plant, so the human mind can understand oh so little. And it thinks all that time, that it can understand everything, and it ignorantly boasts that true understanding is impossible without its help and its supervision. Isn't that so? You know, it, it has its uses, but those uses are extremely limited. It can't do everything, and it is not required for everything like it thinks and insists it is. If you are trusting in Jesus, you have nothing to fear. So, it's okay, isn't it, for you to let go of these things and to see what would happen if you let go of worry. Or to see what would happen if you let go of fear. Perhaps you could see what would happen if you let go of your attachments. Or you might find out what would happen if you let go of your past. Or of the mind's imag imaginary need for a future. You know, it's, it's incredibly interesting to be sitting in a room full of people and to be fully present. Chances are, no one else in the room is. <laughs> They're totally lost in the mind. They're talking about the past. They're talking about the future. They're talking about things that are not here and things that are not now. And they're totally lost in those things. And you know, that's perfectly fine. Remembering stories can be a wonderful thing to do, and sharing them with others can be wonderful. Planning for a possible future can be both fun and sometimes very necessary. Talking about things that are not that are not here and now is fine too, and, and, and it can on rare occasions even be useful. But sitting there in that room, being fully present, you will hear the silence that makes all that chatter possible. You will feel the stillness that enables all of the physical movement. And it just might feel as it would if one were standing under an evening sky in which a sunset unlike any other that has ever been seen or even imagined is blazing across the sky with breathtaking glory and splendor, unbelievable, these vivid colors, while 
Everyone around you is staring at their smartphones, <laughs> reading Facebook posts, or playing Candy Crush. <laughs> and they aren't even aware of what's taking place in the sky above them or in the world around them. Perhaps their friends are even talking about what they heard is going up in the sky above them. But all any of them see of it is their imaginations about it. They don't even know how to look away from their phone and lift their faces to the sky and behold the glory of life that is all around them right now. And that's exactly how it is in that busy room. And you want to point to the sky and say, Look, see the splendor. Bask in the unspeakable glory. And you know, that's what I'm saying to you right now. Put down your phone. Step out of your mental prison. There is no true peace there. And where there is no true peace, there can be no true joy. And you know, joy is not happiness. Happiness comes and happiness goes. It comes with a happy thought and it goes with a sad one. But joy does not depend on circumstances or thoughts. Instead, joy comes effortlessly out of the deep sea of true peace. And peace comes all on its own when you step out of time and form and the things of this earth and the forms of thought and the control of the human mind, and the need to change everything, or control everything, or fight against life, against what is. And instead, you just breathe. Life is beautiful. Whatever you see that looks ugly, that's not life. It might be thoughts about what the mind thinks is life. But life is beautiful. Life is glorious. Life is never ending. Life is timeless. Life is forever. And life is always being breathed from the mouth of God. Those are nice thoughts, but unspeakable, glorious reality and thoughts. Uh, unspeakable, glorious reality is thoughts, uh, let me say that again, <laughs> but unspeakable glorious reality is, is a reality that thoughts can never understand. For the flesh, the world, the human mind cannot see him as he is. And seeing him as he is, is the only way to be like him. When you see him, you will be as he is. You know, someday, we will all wake up. Someday, we will all see the sunset. But today, do you have worry? Do you have stress today? Do you have tension? Do you have resentment? Do you have unforgiveness? 
Do you have inner suffering, inner turmoil? Do you have anxiety? Do you have some confusion? Do you have any doubt? It's because you're identified with the mind. You are lost in its stories. You take its thoughts too seriously. You believe in its past and in its future. You are lost in its fighting against life, which is what is right here and right now. Now, of course, you can hold on to worry. You can hold on to fear, to stress, to doubt. You can hold on to anxiety and on to suffering if you want to. You cannot wake up until you're ready to wake up. That's just how it is. And that's okay. You cannot be free until you're ready to let go of the chains that have you bound. But if you want to see what would happen if you were to step out of the drama-drunk mind <laughs> and come fully into life, then you can. <laughs> you won't go crazy. <laughs> In fact, you'll finally experience true sanity. How? Breathe. <laughs> now, the mind panics and says, breathe? <laughs> no way. That's new age. It's, it's a cult. It's, it's satanic. And you'll get demon possessed if you pay attention to breathing. Consciously breathing is of the devil. The Bible says, do not let your left lung know what your right lung is doing. Doesn't it? Something like that. <laughs> but seriously, though. The mind does not want you to be present. It wants you it, it wants to remain your imagined provider, your leader, your captain, your God. Yes. And you know, that's okay. Just feel your breath going in, pausing, and going out anyway. Really, it's okay with God if you feel yourself breathing. <laughs> and you know that's true. What else could be more simple? What else could be more basic? And yes, what else could be more spiritual? In the physical, we know that God formed man out of the dust of the earth. In the Spiritual, we know that God breathed into man, into that form, the breath of life, his breath. The life in your body is not evil. It's the breath of God. When you can feel someone's breath on your cheek, you know that you and they are close. Feel God's breath on your cheek, in your lungs, in your hands, in your feet. Feel his breath. That's okay. As the scripture says, from your belly flows what? Rivers of living water. Life. Only here and only now as if there is any other time. And from there, and from that place of just being present with the breath of God in you, you can hear the sounds that are all around you. Not thinking about them, but just letting them be. And you can see the objects all around you, not, not labeling them, but 
just letting them be, being present as they are present. You know, I, I look around me and, and I, I see the wall and I see some furniture in the room. And I might look at that furniture and that furniture is just present. I could label it. I could call it a chair. But, you know, let the labels go. That's what the mind does. It's, it's like a little monkey or parrot. It calls out. Well, you already know what that is. You already see its form, but it labels it and puts it in a box. Let that come and go. That chair is present. And I am here with it as it is. Now, don't worry. I'm not giving you exercises or some type of rituals or spiritual techniques. All of this originally came quite naturally in the garden. Feel life. Be fully here right now. Enjoy the glory and the splendor in which you are bathed. Use the mind when needed, which, quite honestly, is not really all that often. It's certainly not all the time. That's how it was in the Garden. And I'm sure the Garden of Eden was a beautiful place by the mind's standards. But when the inside is full of peace, from that inner silence and that inner stillness, all things are bathed in beauty. All things radiate the splendor of love, the glory of God whether you're in a garden or you're in a desert. Does any of this resonate with something inside of you? And this isn't theory that can be proven or disproven by the mind. Instead, it's first-hand knowledge, which can only be experienced first-hand. And I'm not telling you all of this in an attempt to form some sort of doctrine that you can believe in or disbelieve. Instead, I want to share with you the glorious sunset, the brilliant colors, the gentle breeze, the sweet smell, the vast peace, the overflowing joy that is always bursting forth from life. And I'll go ahead and wrap up today's service with this. Put your full trust in Jesus. If you do that, then you will experience these things that I've just described someday. And that's beautiful. And if the rest of this touches something within you, if you're ready to wake up right now, then go ahead and put down your symbolic phone, your being lost in the mind. And look at the sky. Breathe in the sweet air. Feel the gentle breeze on your face. Experience the life, the breath of God that fills your earthly form and that surrounds you and that gives life to all forms. And you will see him in that life, for he is that life, and that life is his, and constantly comes from him. And as you see him, be as he is. <laughs>